reciprocal altruism. Where does that come in in terms of potentially making for more peace? And what's clear is, in principle, it should never do it if you're playing only a single round of a game with someone, a game in the prisoner's dilemma sense, because there's absolutely no reason to cooperate because you were never going to face the person again. And this is something that was called by the zoologist Garrett Hardin, the tragedy of the commons in a circumstance of shared resources but limited responsibility and limited repeated interactions. You have to select for selfishness. You have to select for what is termed a Nash equilibrium where the only possible rational thing to do there is to not cooperate. So how do you ever get cooperation to evolve in groups of organisms? So back to the same Axelrod, his work with computer tournaments there with the tit for tat, seeing that under some circumstances one of them can dominate. Tit for tat is a great optimal one. In the real world though, how do you ever jumpstart cooperation? How do you ever get one of those strategies going when the starting state is complete lack of cooperation? We already know one example, which is founder populations. That whole business about get an isolated population has a higher coefficient of relatedness inbred. Out of kin selection, establish high degrees of cooperation. They come back, and it's this group selection phenomenon of you better become as cooperative as them, or you're not going to be able to compete. You can see the same exact thing in circumstances where it is not a founder effect of a population goes away for a while and then comes back, but where a population is functioning in that way amid a sea of non-cooperators. In New York City in the 1980s, there was this totally weird phenomenon in that there were two ethnic groups that were uh, moving into New York at a much higher rate than in the past, Korean immigrants and Lebanese immigrants. And both groups happened to gravitate towards grocery stores. The Korean community, fruit, vegetable stands. Uh, the Lebanese community, more regular old grocery stores. And they were incredibly successful. And these popped up all over the place. And the people who already had the fruit and vegetable stands and stuff started complaining that they were at an unfair disadvantage. How come? Because these Korean shop owners would cooperate with each other. They would give each other interest-free loans. That's not fair. That's not fair that they're being nice to each other. We can't compete. And the same thing with the Lebanese grocery owners, that you had people doing reciprocal altruism in a community of trust. And what they were immediately doing was out-competing the non-cooperators. And amid these bizarre demands for like banning Korean fruit and vegetable stands or somewhat, like this was a point of great hostility during that period in New York City because those people were cheating. They cooperated with each other. So either join in or you will be driven to extinction. So that is one possibility. What are the other circumstances in formal game theory play that favors the emergence of cooperation? Critical one, repetition, that you're going to play against this individual more than just once. If it's one time, it's tragedy of the commons. There's absolutely no reason to select for repeated, to select for cooperation. Repeated interactions, and it opens up the possibility of you being punished for being a cheater. What they call the shadow of future retribution. One qualifier with that, though, you need to have multiple rounds of interactions, but it can't be a known number of rounds. You can't know how many rounds it's going to be. Think through this. You know that this is the very last round you are going to play, and what's the only logical thing to do is to cheat. The very last round functions as if it was a tragedy of the common single game, single round game. So the only logical thing to do is to cheat in the very last round. In which case, the only logical thing to do is to cheat in the next to the last round. And the next to the last, a known number of rounds of interactions immediately does in cooperation because it sort of flows backwards with this collapse of the system. Next. Next thing that favors it is what is called open book play by people in the business, which is you will be playing against a number of different individuals and 
you know, pairs, going cycling through. And the critical thing is when you begin to play with someone else, they can know your record as to how you played in previous games. In other words, once you bring in reputation. When reputation can be possible, suddenly you select for cooperation. Next, what's shown is that if you have people playing in multiple games with each other, especially when they're unsynchronized, you select for cooperation as well. What's this about? What you do is, if one of the games makes it very, very easy in terms of payoff for cooperation to get established, if you intermix rounds of that game with a game in which there is very little motivation for cooperation starting, what you see is a psychological bleed over. If you're cooperating with this person in this game, which is now done here, down, done here, it greatly increases the odds of when doing the other game of beginning to cooperate as well. Multiple games, and it does not take much to see that this is more like the real world than playing Prisoner's Dilemma with one single individual. Next, the possibility of punishing someone when they are a creep. And that's what we heard about before, what is termed now in the field altruistic punishment. If somebody does something crummy to you, you are allowed to expend a certain amount of your resources to take more of the resources away from them. That selects for cooperation. Something that even selects faster is second party altruistic punishing. You're not taking part in the game. You're watching these two individuals, but you have the power to use some of your resources to punish a cheater. An outside enforcer, that selects for cooperation even faster. Then, something that is even more effective, which is termed secondary altruistic punishing. Here's what you do. What you do is somebody, people are observers of other people's interactions and seeing if they're cheating and they can do some altruistic punishment if they think this individual is a jerk and all of that. But here's what you do if there's a circumstance where somebody cheats and this third party individual doesn't punish them, they get punished. What's that about? That's honor code violations. The, that's the expectation that you are supposed to report someone who has had an honor code violation. And if you don't, you will get punished. That selects for cooperation really fast also. And all of these, these have been computer tournaments and all that, you know that world of research by now. Finally, more subtle stuff, give the person the opportunity to drop out of the game, to secede from the game. Give the person the opportunity to not play against you, but to choose, I'll play against all these other individuals, but not that one. Begin to put that power in there, and you select for cooperation that much faster. So that's some good news. Final level, final level at the group selection level. Group selection not in our behaving for the good of the species, but as we know, the more modern version of it. Selection for traits that are only manifest at the level of whole groups. A always loses to B, but groups of A always defeat groups of B. All of the stuff we've been seeing, people suddenly cooperating with each other as a small group and driving the non-cooperators out of business, that's a group selection argument going on there. So you can have that as a means for generating a lot of cooperation. That's great. That makes the world a better place unless there's a downside to it. And back to chimpanzees. What do you have when a bunch of related chimps are having not individual fights with males from the next valley over, but functioning as a group? You are having an example of group selection, which thus brings up one of the most profoundly scary things on this planet, which is when you got a bunch of males who are getting along well with each other and they're beginning to look at the neighbors. Because lots of males cooperating together can make for some very bad neighbors, as some people in the field have emphasized, a decrease in homicide within a group is a prerequisite for inventing genocide between groups. So group selection is not always this magical founder effect of everybody wanting to learn the new folk songs. What you've got instead are circumstances where it can go very wrong. Final amazing example showing the emergence of cooperation. And this was not a game theory demonstration. This was not an experiment. This was a real event that happened, and an extraordinary one. 
This occurred during World War I. A lot of people have learned, have heard about a phenomenon that happened there, a historical incident that was very, very cool, but pales in comparison to what I'm about to tell about. In 1914, the first Christmas of World War I, somehow the decision was made that there was going to be a truce on Christmas Day. All of the fighting up and down the trenches was going to cease for 24 hours, and had has been documented, it was amazing and bizarre men out of the trenches playing soccer with each other from different sides. A bunch of German and French guys playing against some British and German guys on the other side. People exchanging gifts. People exchanging helmets as souvenirs. People singing together. People getting drunk together from the two opposite sides. And eventually, when the officers got them to go back to their job, they returned to trying to kill each other. Amazing, bizarre incident. What was very striking about it is it extended actually two or three days extra longer than planned because the officers couldn't get people to stop doing this. That's very cool. But that's an outside force already establishing the cooperation. Here's something much, much more impressive. And this happened in World War I, and it didn't take a bunch of generals or heads of states to negotiate a truce. The way in which truces would spontaneously emerge over and over again across the trenches. How do you generate a reciprocally altruistic cooperative relationship with the enemy in the trenches over there where you don't speak the same language and you don't even see their faces? Here's what you do. You take your best gunner and have him come up and lob a shell 20 yards behind the trench there and blow up a tree. Now have your gunner lob a shell to hit the exact same spot again and do it again, and do it again, do it a bunch of times. What are you communicating to the other side? This guy's really good, and we're choosing not to put the missile down on top of you. What are you going to do about it? And then the other side would get out their best gunner and do the thing in return, and you have just worked out a non-aggression pact. And this occurred over and over again in the trench warfare, documented in letters by soldiers back home to parents saying, hi, mom and dad, things are OK here. You should, I hope you're worrying less because we've worked out something. Things are a lot better here. There's a lot less people getting hurt. Working it out along those lines, working out a tit-for-tat uh, vulnerability where you had to have a forgiving tit-for-tat. What if somebody messed up and accidentally dropped a shell into the trench on the other side? They got one shot back. Letters. Dear mom and dad, things are okay here. We had an incident the other day. We had this new gunner who didn't really understand how things worked, and I heard he killed four people on their side. They shot one back. They took out three of our people, but everything is okay now. Tit for tat, complete with a forgiving element. This happened again and again and again in the trench warfare, and the only thing that stopped it from spreading is the fact that the officers kept insisting that nobody else was doing this, and these guys were going to get shot and court-martialed if they didn't stop this. And if they had only had cell phones, if they only had communication, if they only had a way of knowing up and down the line that everybody was doing this, they would have stopped the war. Not with a treaty, not with generals, not with heads of state, not with diplomats, but simply a bottom-up way of evolving cooperation, and they would have stopped the war if they knew that they weren't the only ones wanting to do this. Amazing historical incident.